Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the penultimate Heidelberg Joint Astronomical Colloquium. And um, it's my pleasure today to welcome Manami Sasaski, who's going to be telling us about somewhat more energetic processes in the interstellar medium. And I'll just ask Catherine Kreckel to introduce. So Manami did her undergraduate studies here in Heidelberg a few years ago. <laughs> and then, so she's enjoying being back in this room. Um, she did her PhD at MPE and then did a postdoc at Harvard and in Tübingen. And then she started an Emmy Neuter research group there in Tübingen. Um, after that, she was a Heisenberg fellow and then a Heisenberg professor, and she's now a professor since 2016 in Erlangen at the ECAP, the Erlangen Center for Astroparticle Physics, although she actually sits in Bamberg most of the time. Uh, and she's an expert on X-rays and Eva Zeta, and so I'm looking forward to hearing about the hot phase of the interstellar medium. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, can you hear me? Is that working? Okay. So uh, hello everyone, I'm Manami Sasaki. Um, I'm from yeah, Karl Rehmeis Observatory in Bamberg, which is the Astronomical Institute of the University of Erlang-Nürnberg. So that's why you see so many names. And uh, yeah, it's a big pleasure for me to be here. So I'm very honored to be invited to this uh, colloquium. So thank you very much to the organizers. And also it's very nice for me to be back here again because it's kind of like returning to my roots. As Catherine already mentioned, this is where everything started for me. So I, in, especially in this lecture hall, I heard my first lectures in physics in theoretical and in experimental physics, like sitting in the very last row, maybe having breakfast when it was too early. <laughs> And also listening to this physics colloquium, which I assume doesn't take place here anymore. Yeah, so like a young student, which I was, yeah, some time ago, <laughs> I was also sitting here and looking at these, uh, all these physics professors and was very impressed. And now I'm standing here. Uh, so yeah, it's a big honor for me. And I am going to talk about the hot phase of the interstellar medium, which is uh, rather, um, a phase, a phase, a topic that is often forgotten um, when people talk about the interstellar medium because it's very tenuous and difficult to understand. Um, but as you will see, it's very important for the evolution of galaxy, like change in the evolution of the ISM, and also has an uh, implication for the stellar evolution. So um, here you see. Um, some of the people that I have a big collaboration, a long collaboration going on, and also, yeah, um, mainly people from Erosita, which I will be also talking about. Uh, so first, let me start by showing you what uh, what we know is the interstellar medium. So the main components. We have the cold component, the warm component, and the hot component. The, what you see in red is the cold component. It's the H1 distribution in, and that's an area, a large area inside the small, uh, sorry, large Magellanic cloud. You might recognize this thing. That's the Tarantula nebula. And that's what you see in green because uh, I'm showing the H alpha emission, the warm phase in green. And what you also see is that there is an additional component shown in blue, that's X-rays. So this is the diffuser emission seen in uh, with Erosita, um, filling all these voids that you see in the distribution of the cold and the warm phase. So you see uh, a lot of large structures like the supergiant shells, you see super bubbles, and also like smaller things like supernova remnants. These are all components in the interstellar medium, which you can clearly see, especially in this hot phase. And this was already known uh, earlier before we had Erosita um, already, especially when Rosat, the German um, Röntgen te um, telescope in the 1990s did the first survey of the LMC. Um, and 
what creates this hot phase? I just want to uh, quickly go through these steps. So first of all, you have, as most of you most likely know, you have the massive stars which have um, photoionizing radiation, create H2 regions. And then you have the shocks that then run in, uh, shocks uh, caused by the stellar winds that then run in run into this H2 region. And then what you then create by this shock is a bubble like this, it's nicely seen in this bubble nebula. And this is caused by the strong uh, shock of the stellar wind. And typically stars are not born as, as an, uh, an isolated object. So if, uh, sorry, one, going back, what you see here is like this shell that is formed by the shock. That's what, what you can see in the distribution of the density, it's higher here. And that's why um, where the shock is, that's why you see the strong H alpha emission. If you look at the distribution of temperature, you realize that it's much higher in the interior than in the outer shell. And this is where you would see the uh, hot gas, the X-ray emission coming from the hot gas. So such a bubble uh, is filled by hot in, um, ionized gas. And then since you have many stars, what you get after a while is a larger structure, what we call a super bubble. It's again the same. You have a shell seen in H alpha now in orange, and then the, the hot um, ionized gas filling this super bubble in, in X-rays, now it's shown in magenta. This is a super bubble uh, um, seen in the large Magellanic cloud. And what you also see is this bright thing here, that's a supernova remnant. And um, yeah, typically super bubbles have sizes of about 100 parsecs. So it's much bigger than a single bubble because it's yeah, just a collection of input from all these stars that are inside. And then if you have gen many generation of stars at this position, then this intensity medium keeps changing. And then you get uh, these large structures, which I also showed before, something that we call a super giant shell where you have like a very large H alpha shell, um, also visible in, in the H1 distribution with diameters of kiloparsecs. And this also is filled with uh, X-ray emitting hot gas. And um, this is not only so such large structures are not only caused by the stellar winds, as, as I mentioned before, also, the stars inside these super bubbles, they will at some point die in a supernova. And then what happens is if you have these um, partially or fully ionized gas, there will be an additional uh, energy release and an additional shock that runs into the medium. And then uh, you will have an additional heating and the object that is created by a supernova shock that is called a supernova remnant. And First, I would like to talk a little about the supernova remnants because these are really the most prominent ISM, so interstellar sources in, in X-rays and also are responsible for, for most of the energy input uh, for this hot phase. So what you see are supernova remnants, like composite image of an optical image and an X-ray image of historical supernova remnants. On the left, you see, uh, the remnant of the supernova seen by Tycho Brahe about 450 years ago. Then you have the supernova remnant seen by Johannes Kepler. And this one is called Cassiopeia A, and it was most likely seen by a Dutch um, astronomer called Flamsted. And what you see is a three color image in X-rays together with an optical image where you see these stars. Um, in which you have the um, hi highest energy photons shown in blue. And then you have the, the, the middle range about one kilo electron volts, two kilo electron volts shown in green. And the very soft photons below, let's say 0 0.5 kilo electron volts in, in red. And then you nicely see a difference in a bit, uh, different regions. So here, in many of these young supernova remnants, you see this um, outer shock wave, the blast wave of the supernova with uh, higher photo, uh, higher energy photons. And then in the interior, you see the emission coming from the um, shock heated interstellar gas and ejector from the, pro from the progenitor star. 
Uh, so typically what you have, if you have an in, um, supernova remnant is the shock waves will heat and ionize the intestinal medium to like a fully ionized state. You will also have the elements that were created in the star and also during the explosion that will be distributed in the intestinal medium. And these shocks are also very strong shocks. So particles can be accelerated. That's also the reason why they are remnants are also bright in radio. So even before we knew about um, gamma ray emission from supernova remnants, which hints at particle acceleration in the remnant shock, we actually knew that particle acceleration is going on because we see them in radio and that's coming from the electrons that emit uh, synchrotron emission. And yeah, with this, with this expansion, with their dynamics, they will also create new structures like contributing to the formation of super bubbles. Um, just to explain a little more what you can see in X-rays, another example, this is the brightest supernova remnancy in a small Magellanic cloud called EO102. Again, in some three color X-ray plus some um, optical and infrared data. And here again, you see in the outer part, you see the um, forward outer shock expanding into the interstellar medium. That's really the place where the interstellar matter is shocked. And then in the center, since this is a rather young supernova remnant in the interior, you see another shock that is now running from the outside towards the center of the supernova remnant and heating the material this is, that's inside. So this is the material coming from the progenitor star because this was a core collapse supernova remnant. Uh, or supernova. And this material, this is now expanding, is heated by this, what we call a reverse shock. And since this matter is very dense, you can also see it in the optical. So you, this white uh, filamentary structure that you see in, inside, that's optical emission coming from this supernova remnant. And in X-rays, typically you would see something like this. That's a, a model showing what, uh, what spectral uh, components you would see. You have the Bremsstrahlung from, um, from, from the electrons with some uh, continuum emission from recombination and other transitions. And then you have all these lines that are heavily um, ionized. And depending on what uh, elements you have, I mean, like in the optical, you, you, you will see different lines and you can do some uh, plasma di diagnostics. And also, since we are counting each of the photons, we can separate the, the data that we get in X-rays into these different, um, um, for different energies. And this is shown here. So this is again, uh, this remnant that I showed before, Cassiopeia A. This is also a core collapse supernova remnant. On, on the right-hand side, what you see is uh, images that are created in different energy bands. So this is the entire band that was observed with Chandra that's below 10 kilo electron volts. But then you can go back to the position of these element lines and then extract um, images at certain energies, um, for example, around the silicon line, around the calcium line, or an iron line, and then you can see the distribution of the elements in the, in this remnant. This remnant is a core collapse remnant, as you can see, because there is a bright spot here. I hope you can see that. That's the newborn neutron star, which is also very bright in X-rays. So look, by looking at such images, you can also get an idea of how the explosion must and, uh, and, and the structure of the progenitor must have been. Um, and can, this can be compared to uh, supernova explosion models. You can also extract like in specific regions, for example, here or in here, which looks uh, have a weird um, characteristics and then compare the spectra. So this is just typically what an X-ray spectrum of a bright remnant would look like. So if you look like this outer part, you get a lot of emission coming from different elements. But then clearly, if you go in, into this interior regions, you can uh, find regions in which the spectrum is clearly dominated by the iron emission. 
um, if you have enough photons, you can do it also in much smaller regions. And that was what became possible with EROSITA. EROSITA, as you might know, is a new X-ray telescope that was launched almost, um, uh, no, four years ago and um, is carry, uh, has been carry, carrying out an all-sky survey in X-rays below, uh, below 10 kilo electron volts. And this is the first imaging all-sky survey since ROSAT, which I mentioned before, in the soft X-ray band. So we have now uh, data of the entire sky with, in compared to ROSAT, with much better in, in imaging, so spatial resolution and also spectral resolution. And since we have this imaging and this um, spectral resolution, now what we can do is even look at like, uh, larger structures like this one that's called Puppies 8 and bright supernova remnant. And you see it's uh, one degree big. And now you can go and take spectra at each of the position. This is what we have done. And what you see here below is a map of the distribution of the elements that you get from the spectra analysis. So you, you look at each of those spectra and then you compare it with thermal model, you realize if you assume solar abundance, it, uh, the fit doesn't, doesn't work. So you tweak your abundances and you get the abundance, uh, the emission right. And as you see, there is a region inside somewhere here where all the element abundance are enhanced. So this seems to be the position where the progenitor star must have been. The interesting thing is this is also a core collapse remnant. This thing is, um, also as a um, neutron star. And we know that this neutron star has a proper motion into this direction. So this is also consistent with the fact that the explosion must have been, uh, must have occurred somewhere here. And then it also can help us to understand the core collapse supernova mechanism better. Um, speaking of Erosita, this is maybe something that you have already seen. So this is the first all-sky survey we got from Erosita. We now have four of those com in, in completely. So four, uh, four times the data that you see here. And that's the emission that you can see in, X, in soft X-ray. So again, this is color-coded again about 0 0.5 kilo electron volts is, is red, it's soft diffuse emission. Then you see the green emission around one kilo electron volts and then the harder emission in blue. And as you can see, um, it's very dark in the galactic disk where lots of X-rays uh, are absorbed. You see a lot of point sources in the galactic disk, most likely they are accreting neutron stars or black holes, so compact objects. And then you have lots of diffuse emission that looks interesting. The remnant um, Puppis A that I showed you before is located here, actually in this region. This bright thing is another supernova remnant called Vila. Um, I guess you have heard before, it's also very bright in, or rather bright in X-ray, uh, in the optical. It's a very, uh, yeah, extended nearby supernova remnant, has a Vila Pulsa in it. Some very interesting source. Puppies A is one that is located here. It's, it's seen in projection, but much farther, further away. And the interesting thing is in Vila region, we see also another core collapse supernova remnant, which we call the Vila Junior, with uh, a nice round shell. I hope you can see it, and a neutron star sitting inside. And we are uh, analyzing these data to understand these emission much better. Now, since we now have this uh, complete data, so now we don't have to point many times to cover each of these objects. And what you also see is in, in this X-ray sky, there are even much bigger structures like this or that. And these are also known to be very nearby supernova remnants. So this, these are sources which you only can study if you have the all sky survey data. So now we are currently doing the spectral analysis of this structure, which we call the monogem ring and the Antlia supernova remnant, most likely in the very neighborhood uh, of the, um, the, the sun, but at the distance of only um, a couple of pars uh, hundred parsecs. Um, studying supernova remnants, in if they are so near, we can learn a, a lot about the physics in our galaxy is very important. But 
as you have seen, X-rays are absorbed very quickly. So everything that is in the galactic disk, we can't study very well. So if you want to understand the entire population of a supernova remnant, it is possible to do so in the Milky Way. So what we also do is to look at supernova remnants in, a, in other galaxies, especially the Magellanic Clouds are very well studied, and also the nearby um, um, nearby large <laughs> spiral galaxies. Sorry, this was the microphone. And um, yeah, so the, the advantage of looking at supernova remnant populations in other galaxies is it, they are at, ap approximately at the same distance, so we know the energy budget well. And we can also study the different effect of their environments. So for example, looking at um, supernova remnants in the large Magellanic cloud with XMM, we did a large survey. These are the element abundances that we get just looking at the supernova remnant, assuming that older remnants show a lot of emission from the shocked ISM. And this is comparison to other X-ray studies and, um, and uh, other abundance studies. So this is quite uh, consistent. So X-ray emission can be used to study element abundances. We can also compare the position of the supernova remnants with the underlying stellar population and to find out whether we have core collapse supernova remnants here. So this is the star formation history at the position of the supernova remnant. And you see in the earlier, uh, like um, the, um, in the last uh, 10 to the seven years or so, there was, was a lot of star formation going on. So most likely this, it can be a core collapse, or if you see like this, you, there was not much star formation going on at these positions. Most likely these sources are type 1a supernova remnants. And then if you can select those, those classes, you can separate them and also study the, um, the different types of supernova remnants. And that's, um, and, but this is only possible. Um, only possible if you can also study the um, spectral properties. And this one you have seen before, this is the bright, was the brightest, was a core collapse. So you see, typically you have a spectrum like this with a lot of emission from oxygen, neon, magnesium, like all these alpha elements coming from the star. This one is a type 1a supernova, also from the LMC. And um, you see the spectrum looks completely different. And the reason is in this case, now we see the uh, products of the nuclear synthesis of the supernova, and we see a lot of iron here. This is iron L shell emission, which is not resolved with the CCD resolution, but which we, we can use this information also um, to separate between types of supernova remnant in, by again, creating images in different energy bands, like I said before. Now I'm using a larger band and creating these three color images. And if you separate, you realize this one will look more red and maybe also bluer because this, maybe you can't see this difference, but typically this is brighter, but this one will be, will look very green because it has the very bright emission of iron. So even for, fainter sources where we cannot extract the spectrum and do the um, detailed analysis by just um, separating the photons into these three bands, we can also study the their emission. And using this information plus the um, underlying stellar populations, what we did here is select only the type 1a supernova remnants and from small to large, and so you see this, this scale bar is always one arc seconds, uh, arc minutes, sorry. So it's, they're growing in size. And you see, now you can nicely see how a type 1a supernova remnant evolves. So in the beginning, you see the emission coming from the mix of the interstellar medium and the, um, and the hot ejector. And then the interstellar medium becomes much uh, fainter and fainter because the shock slows down. And then what you end up with is the iron emission coming from the nuclear synthesis. For core collapse supernova remnant, it's not that easy to see uh, any sequence because they come from different types of um, procedures, the different circumstellar medium, different history. So we see a lot of uh, different morphologies for core, core collapse supernova remnants. 
Um, to study the entire population, what we're doing now with Erosita again, because we have the full coverage and especially the LMC, we have a lot of data. So we are now uh, studying first the supernova remnants and the candidates, with, which we already know. And then we are now looking for new supernova remnants and also for those who are we, there have been no X-ray detection yet, but were, were known in radio or in the optical, we are trying to get some X-ray upper limits. So we have a kind of a complete set of supernova remnant population in, in the large Magellanic cloud and also in the small Magellanic cloud. Now, uh, my talk was, is, is supposed to be on the ISM, not only on supernova remnants. So um, now I'm switching the topic a little bit, but I still stay in this fa uh, most yeah, favorite galaxy of mine, the large Michelin cloud. So you, you know this image, you see a lot of stars. This is the uh, Tarantula Nebula. And if you look into, uh, into the warm medium, the Taking with filters, you see this nicely, these H alpha emission, uh, sorry, H2 regions that, that are distributed everywhere. And when people started doing uh, um, surveys of the atomic hydrogen, we realized that it, this entire structure really looks like a disk where maybe kind of hint of a spiral structure, maybe not, but with a lot of voids, which also correlate with the distribution of H2 region. This is also what um, made people, uh, um, allowed people to, to find these large structures, these super giant shells in the large Magellanic cloud. Um, then with the X-ray uh, survey, what we then first saw is that these voids that you see here, so the cold and warm medium, this is entirely filled with diffuse gas. So this green emission is diffuse emission in soft X-rays seen with ROSAT, but that's the resolution of ROSAT. That was the spatial resolution and we didn't almost have no spectral resolution. So we only could see that there is diffuse emission, we couldn't, but we couldn't do much about it. Uh, so what we started doing when uh, about 10, 20 years ago, XMM Newton was launched, we started uh, proposing surveys um, like many pointings in the large Magellanic cloud. So this is what it looked like on like about 20 years later, we have a lot of them, uh, um, a big interesting part of the LMC covered, but still a lot of uh, missing. And I hope you can see that there is some diffuse emission here again in three colors. So um, this red emission, this, this diffuse emission is rather soft, while in some H2 regions like this in Tarantula Nebula, or next to it, 30 Doratus C, you see a, a hotter, like um, high, higher energy emission. Uh, I want to now discuss a little bit, this one that's uh, one H2 region in the south, it's uh, nicely located, uh, not in the, in the um, crowded region, so it's easy, uh, yeah, easier to understand. So this is what it looks like in the optical. In red, you see the H alpha and uh, combined with green, in green, the S2 emission. And I think many of you know this line emission much better than I do. But uh, what, what we know, what we can use is if you have a higher S2 ratio to, uh, sorry, S2 emission, forbidden S2 emission to compare to H alpha, what we see is shocked emission, not photoionized emission. And this is also what you can see here. This one is a known supernova remnant. It's also very bright in X-rays. Now compared to this uh, um, H-alpha emission, which is now shown here in contours, um, you realize that there is also an additional emission that is filling this void in this uh, H-alpha. And if you look closer, so this is now again, three color image, red is very uh, soft there is some blowout, which maybe you don't see. So some faint emission going towards the north. And if you compare this distribution with this H alpha emission or even with the H1 distribution at that position, so this um, lighter, uh, brighter regions is, means more H1, you see there is a density gradient. So there is a cavity which in which this hot phase is located. And since there is a density gradient, some gas is escaping out of the H2 region. And this H2 region also looks like broken. And this 
So this is uh, definitely a super bubble that is was created by the stars in this. So you have a, a cluster here and associations here. So these stars must have uh, created that. And yeah, so we have also studied um, the input of the stellar winds coming from these uh, stellar associations and cluster. Another thing that's interesting is since, uh, as I said before, this S2 emission, S2 to H alpha ratio is a good uh, tracer of shocked emission. Uh, what you see here in, as contours is are the regions in which S2 over H alpha is very enhanced. And you can see, so th this contour indicates where this supernova remnant um, is located, but also around the H2, region you see some kind of a shell-like structure you see this um, green circle so it it looks like inside the super bubble there must have been also a supernova that have expanded very quickly because you have seen tenuous gas inside the super bubble and now hit uh, and then has hit the outer parts of the super bubble in addition, we have also found using this technique, another supernova remnant, which was not known in this region because you clearly see there is a structure which was not known, was seen before. And then we followed it up with XMM. This is what you've seen before in this uh, sequence of type 1A supernova remnants, where you have a lot of iron l shell emission in the center. So this is a type 1A supernova remnant most likely not associated to the H2 region, but seen in projection. You can do studies like that also in, in other galaxies, like M31 is still very close, and it's also similar to our galaxy, so it's interesting to see what the distribution of the hot interstellar gas is. So we've, we've been also doing some survey, again, using XMM-Newton. This is an image of M31 after taking out all the point sources. Now you see this nuclear region is very bright, but or even if you go outside, you see some diffuse emission, which is on one hand correlated with this uh, pronounced dust ring that is known in, so like the spiral arm of M31, but also a lot of emission in, in the regions between. So we have been studying this emission again to, to under, better understand the uh, uh, distribution of the hot phase of interstellar medium in, in such a spiral galaxy, um, especially like comparing with multi-wavelength data. This is dust data, massive stars, H alpha emission, and then atomic hydrogen. And you can also look in this, do a similar study like what we did in the LMC. You look, you uh, recognize here again another um, super, uh, super bubble, you can look at the X-ray um, data, and then based on the stars that you find at that position, you can do some calculations of the energy input and compare what you get um, with what, what we, well, this, with the therm thermal energy, which we can get from the um, X-ray analysis. So they are all consistent. And what these studies always show is um, typically, if you see some diffuse emission in the interstellar medium, you can model it as a thermal emission coming from thermal plasma, often two or more components with one with a lower temperature, which looks like is broadly distributed. It's kind of like the relaxed state of the hot phase and some um, hotter component. So this is the cooler component and the hotter component in regions where we have like super bubbles and also star forming regions. So this is what you see if there is an effect of stellar feedback. Um, then in our galaxy, the most well-known bright uh, H2 region is the Carina Nebula, not a nice image, I admit but I wanted to show, show you a broader range. So this is the galactic disk. It's in, in, in the optical and in, in also seen in infrared. And if you look at it in X-rays, it looks like this. And again, this is a large structure, as you can see. And with Erosita, we again had for the first time a complete data of this H2 region. So now we can also study H2 regions in our galaxy in detail. 
Uh, this is again a three color image. So you see the different colors of like, uh, this is Eta Carine. It's very bright all over the entire X-ray uh, range, but then you have also other O and wolf stars that are rather hot sources. And then the diffuse emission is reddish to greenish. We extracted spectrum again and studied the emission of, of course, after re re removing the com contamination of, uh, or yeah, emission from these stars. And what you see again, you can model it as two component plasma. And that's what you see here is the entire spectrum that you get out of such a region. Um, and there is also the diffuse local X-ray background in it. So the, in X-rays, you, uh, you have a lot of contamination with all the other X-ray emission coming from it, plus the instrumental background. So that's what you see here is a line so we have to model it. We cannot just act, um, subtract it from the data. So you have a lot of components, but what you see with this thick dash dotted lines, these are the components that were uh, modeled for the emission. So in the central region around these stars, we have two thermal components and an additional non-thermal component is necessary. So this weird uh, bump, that's the non-thermal component, which should be a line, but folded by the telescope response. It looks like, uh, I don't know what. Um, here in this outer parts, you don't need that. So that here you definitely see the effect of, um, of the, the massive stars inside. And um, if you now compare the distribution of the X-ray emission with emission that you see, for example, in H1, where you see a cavity here, cavity there, and this, so there is a big cavity in here. This was uh, where the gas was blown away by the, uh, by the massive stars. This is nice, ni nicely correlates with the X-ray emission. So this X-ray emission seems to be filling these cavities. Uh, that's um, radio synchrotron, um, continuum emission, it's a mix of synchrotron and Bremsstrahlung emission. So you see all the uh, electrons um, in, in the H2 region. And um, you can compare that with calculations of, of uh, the stellar input to create such super bubbles and the luminosities that we get in X-rays are very consistent. But the, the most prominent thing in the X-rays is this weird uh, V-shaped thing, which we call the X-ray hook. And if you look at the distribution of the very cold gas here, this is uh, the contours RCO gas, you see that this is nicely aligned with this, um, this weird, yeah, like arrow, uh, no, alley type um, morphology. So it seems like emission uh, gas that is blown by or heated by these massive stars are now hitting a wall here and then kind of compressed and redirected and forming the X-ray hook. And if you look at this emission here, you see it can be modeled. You don't need a non-thermal emission. You can model it as a thermal emission and the hotter component is also much, much more prominent pronounced than in the other regions. Yeah, so these are the things that you can do if you uh, if you can do spectral analysis of H2 regions and super bubbles. And in uh, I also wanted to mention a little bit uh, uh, some different study which we also did again coming going back to the large Magellanic cloud. So. You know, uh, the large Magellanic cloud, in the large Magellanic cloud, we have this Tarantula nebula, which is a very big uh, H2 region, uh, which we call it like a giant H2 region, only known in the LMC and in the uh, local group of galaxies. There is only one another known in, in M33, which is also a strong uh, star forming galaxy. And this is full, uh, as, as you know, full of um, very massive stars. And the question is, how can you create something like this? And people came up with some explanation for that. So what, what was known when uh, the first H1 studies of the LMC was done is that this, this like distribution of the atomic hydrogen, which I talked about, 
is not only just one component that like entirely belongs to the LMC, but can be distinguished between a co component that we call the disk component and another component which we call the L component. And you see that uh, the, the difference is here in the velocity distribution. So uh, if this, the D component is the systemic velocity of the LMC, there is clearly a separation for this L component which is blue shifted. And what people have also realized is that this L component is only seen in this range where also a lot of star formation is going on and the, where the Tarantula Nebula is located. Another thing that you see here is if you look at the, so this is the position of the superstar cluster in, in Tarantula Nebula, uh, um, 136. And then you also see um, the distribution of the CO, like um, molecular clouds, CO cloud. And what you see is, of course, there are many molecular clouds in the LMC, but there is a big ridge of connected molecular clouds here, just going from the Tarantula Nebula just southward. And also a lot of uh, molecular clouds that form like a uh, yeah, structure here, shell-like structure here. And it seems to be correlated with this L component. And so what people did is they, they took also the emission at this position where the L component is pronounced and at this position where the Tarantula Nebula and this CO ridge is located. And what you then get is that on the left hand side, you above, so north of the Tarantula Nebula, it's just one component, but south of it, you clearly see a diff two different components. So this is the L component and the D component. On the other hand, here in um, at this position, you see, you don't see a clear separation. So towards right below the Tarantula Nebula, these two components are not separated. And if you look at also taking into account velocities, if you look at the distribution of the um, molecular clouds, you also realize that uh, they, these molecular clouds are located in this mixing component, which we call the intermediate component. So what this shows is there must be, so there was the disk component, there was the uh, main component of the LMC, and then most likely, due to the tidal interaction between the Magellanic clouds, some of the material coming from the SMC must hit through the LMC, and which is also uh, confirmed by the distribution of the stars because in this area, stars have been found, which have rather as SMC abundance than the LMC abundance. And this component is seems to be moving through this uh, this component. And that's why and, and this collision has started on this side. So here it already passed through the disk component, but here it is still going on. And somehow the Tarantula Nebula is connected to this. So what, uh, just for a comparison in X-rays on the other hand, also for quite a long time, we knew that this region, which we now looked at, looked different than the other parts of the LMC. So this is this is the distribution of the diffuse gas here on the um, lower left, like in the southeast. If you uh, plot the X-ray emission again in three colors, you see that this part is much hotter than the other part. It's it appears very green. And it also has this weird triangular structure. And we did some spectral analysis and co also compared the distribution of the uh, hot phase between this disk component, which you see here in red, that's uh, the D component and the L component. And what you, what you now clearly see is that this X-ray emission is located in between this L component and the D component and fills this part, which is filled by this intermediate component, the I component. 
and the western uh, edge of this um, this triangular shaped structure is aligned with the CO ridge that we see. Um, and interestingly, if you look at the distribution of the massive stars, and this is also clear if you compare this distribution with, uh, with H alpha emission, there are lots of massive stars, of course, around 30 Doradus and also in other parts, but in this region, we don't find any O stars and Wolfe stars and also no B stars, so no massive stars. So this, there is a very hot component in X-ray um, in X-ray emitting plasma, and which is also bright, but there are no stars that have created, can have created this hot phase. Therefore, what we believe is this is also has something to do with this collision of the gas. So yeah, again, so now, uh, in illustrations to explain it. So you have the, this component. There is this A component that went through the disk component and it's interacted first at this in, in the north. So now it already compressed the gas and for, started forming uh, massive stars. So that's what you now see as the Tarantula Nebula. And then it moved on. And now this part is bright in X-rays while maybe part of the L, uh, the L component is still behind the D component is not interacting. And the, the star formation is now going on uh, somewhere here, which in, in this maybe in these molecular clouds, which you see as a CO ridge. So we think that this, uh, the formation of these very massive stars must have to do some, um, with this large scale collision in, uh, of of gas in the large Magellanic cloud. And since we don't see any heating, um, uh, stars that must have created the heating in X-rays, we believe this X-ray emission must be in principle similar to uh, the, the, the plasma must be similar to what we see in the rest of the galaxy, but now it's compressed through uh, by the um, collision of the two, two clouds and is now seen as a much hotter gas and only in this region. And maybe if this, go, if we, we could, we wait a little longer and could observe it, maybe we will see some more H2 regions and large um, massive star clusters, even in the parts where we see the X-ray emission, who knows? We won't find out. Um, this brings me already to the end of my talk. So I talked about the hot phase of the interstellar medium, and I hope I can could, uh, make clear that in the interstellar shocks are very important caused by stellar winters and, and supernova explosions. And this creates the hot interstellar plasma, which you can see like here in the LMC or in the M31. And this, the interaction of the shock is important for the evolution of the ISM and it will also affect have some effect on star, star formation like you saw in the collision but in principle you would uh, also yeah, there are also supernova remnants which are located next to star formation regions which and uh, seems to interact with some star forming regions which I didn't include for time reasons but there are um, places like this, and we are studying them, especially in the large Magellanic cloud again, my favorite galaxy. And uh, in addition, for example, in Carina Nebula, we could also see indications of particle acceleration even in the X-rays. So this is something we need to follow up. And we can do the similar we can do similar studies also in other galaxies, especially in the nearby spiral galaxy, to understand the. Um, evolution of the ISM and the, um, the relation and the implication of abundances and environments much better. And yes, that was it. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Manami. Uh, that was a real tour of especially the supernova remnants, but also a very interesting part about large-scale um, collisionally heated uh, shock, heated gas in, in the galaxy. Um, I'll open the floor for questions. 
Um, I see that Hans Sinica has a question. Hans Sinica, yeah, from Chile. Yeah. Hello, Hans. Yes, yes, yes um, I'm here. <laughs> before we move to questions from the Zoom audience, please, uh, we'll start with the questions in the audience here. If you, if there's anybody who wants to kick off. Yeah, Brian. From Reville. Thanks, Sophie. Um, the, the non-thermal emission from the Carina Nebula, associate all of this to Eta Carina itself, or is there any way of knowing where it's coming from? It's difficult to say because, of course, um, there is an issue with the resolution as well, but we try to extract as much as possible the emission coming from the source itself, so from the star itself, and took uh, the spectrum in a very large region, and we still see this uh, additional component. So most likely it is outside the star itself, or the, the also the small nebula around it. Yeah, so should be careful with this. Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, question from Ralph Klessen. Super cool. I tried to digest your scenario for the formation of the Tarantula Nebula. Yeah. And I'm, I think it's a cool idea, but I'm wondering about the timescales, right? Aren't there from the work of Fabian Schneider and others, older stars, let's say 10, a million years old, some people like like us, we have modeled a second generation of stars, which would make the actual formation or the first formation of the first generation further in the past than three million years. Yeah, no, but uh, the three million years was like where the tidal interaction maybe was, but I think this movement, so I'm not a theoretician that did the calculations, I have to admit, mm -hmm. no, but you know, <laughs> and uh, I think this movement, this triggered the movement. And then I can't, sorry, I'm sorry, I can't tell you exactly the time scale with which this cloud is supposed to move. Um, yeah, but this this is also based on some modeling of cloud collisions uh, okay. done by a group in uh, Australia and Japan. Okay, now for quiz things. Okay. Becky and I, yeah. Any more questions from the hall? I don't see anything. Um, I had a question myself actually about the evolution of the supernova remnants. You showed that very nice sequence of um, type 1a uh, of supernova remnants from type 1a I think it was yes. um, uh, and uh, you know I think the point was that the, the emission from the outer regions where the blast wave is became much weaker yeah. in relation to the inner regions um, my question is um, why doesn't the emission from the inner regions become weaker as well, because even if you have metals there, they still need to be heated to produce the line emission that you see. So do you need an energy source inside those sources to, to, to produce that sequence? Um, right, uh, not really, but yeah, your question is, is well justified. This is, of course, why do you expect no emission coming from the, outer part but only from the central part yes and uh, this is i think uh, first of all the cooling time scale is different for different uh, electrons uh, sorry uh, elements um and uh, also since you have more uh, um, thinner medium around it so the the shock has already cooled down to a point that you don't see it in yeah. soft X rays. Anymore. Yeah, I get I get that part. Yeah. Yes, but this there is still hot emission, which then only can be visible in the most prominent lines, because it 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 does cool much much slower. It's not that the gas is not hot anymore after ten thousand of years. Okay. It it takes like ten to the five years or so to for a hot phase to cool, uh, really cool down, but it's not visible in this range anymore. Right. Do you know what I mean? So well, if it's too hot, you won't see it in the soft X rays, and I, if it's too cool, you won't see it. Maybe, maybe you can explore that 
later with me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just Andreas Buck has a question. Yeah. Okay, Stay, staying here. Mm -hmm. um, these are nice color pictures, but of course for quantitative analysis, um, it might be a bit misleading, even if you just look at the pictures. So what are the decay time scales or if, if you... Yeah, so that's what I meant. It wants you, you have a much faster time scale in the outer regions than in the inner region. No, no. This is shock wave that has yeah. expanded and is now expanding, continuous expanding and getting slower. And the the inner region has been hit uh, hit by the reverse shock and has been heated. So the, the decay time scale is only dependent on the cooling time of the hot plasma that you have now. Yeah, and this is ten to the five years. It ten to the six years, so it's much much longer than mm -hmm. the typical dynamical time scale of a supernova. Okay, yeah, that's why you still see that emission. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions from the hall, and I don't see anything in the chat. And uh, we're just coming up to Hans. Hans Sinica. Yes, I actually asked Hans Sinica, so. Hans, please, um, let's see if I can um, I, I hear you well. Can you hear okay. me? So now, please talk, Hans. OK. Uh, well, first of all, I wanted to say this was a wonderful talk, a brilliant presentation. Fantastic. Uh, second question is, are you going to the German Astronomical Society meeting in Berlin so we could meet? Because I uh, have yes, many I questions. Would, yeah. Oh, maybe I should. Okay, talk. see you there. So yeah. my immediate question is about, uh, not related to X-rays, although I like the X-rays and was involved in the past with Rosat and so on, but I am interested in the dust formation in supernova explosions, because that's a hot topic in the early universe and, and the Magellanic clouds have lower metallicity and in that sense approach the early universe a little closer than our galaxy. So is there any plan to study uh, the dust formation in these supernova ex ex explosions that, or supernova remnants in particular, whether the reverse shock would destroy the dust, but it can't because we have to form dust in supernovae. And we have seen it in, in, in supernova 1987A a little bit, some dust has formed. So can you say anything about this uh, field, which is probably an infrared question, a, a hot topic perhaps by for JWST, and I would encourage you to apply for JWST time with your background data. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you also for the nice comments. Um, first, did, did you hear that at the back of the hall? Uh, yeah. Sort of, okay. So the question was uh, about dust formation and dust destruction in supernova remnants. Uh, this is actually a hot topic in uh, among the infrared community. And uh, I guess you also know that like there were dedicated observations with Sophia for, uh, on um, nearby supernova remnants like Cassiopeia A, I think, or other supernova remnants, especially in Cassiopeia A. What you can see is that this reverse shock um, has uh, makes it very uh, he heats the dust in in the ejector and makes it a very bright infrared uh, source. Yeah. I'm yeah. yeah as as you know I am not an an infrared a dust uh, expert so I can really not tell you much about it but. Um, I, as far as I know, in especially in young remnants where the interaction with the ejector is still going on, um, there are studies done on uh, dust formation and, but m more so on dust destruction in supernova remnants. And I think there are also plans for observations with JWSD. Yeah. Well, anyway, we should talk about that. Hans. Thank you. Okay. Yes, that, that's um. Oh, wait a minute. Just try mm -hmm. to do this. That's it. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, just as a follow-up with the demographics you've got with Erosita, I mean, it has been done with IRAS, and I think um, 
Rosat, certainly, uh, you know, the question of what are the, if, if you have an actual asexual sample, do you see them in infrared um, and vice versa? Is that something that you plan to do? Because from the IRIS study, my, my recollection was that supernova remnants are great at destroying dust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, interestingly, there has, as, as far as I know, there has not been a really systematic study of supernova remnants, for example, in the LMC. Uh, and also the comparison between X-ray and infrared study, uh, supernova remnants. And actually, I have a master's student working on that, like taking old Spitzer data okay. and comparing that. Um, but people have uh, uh, yeah, spent a lot of time and effort in studying like the nearby uh, supernova remnants, like Cassiopeia yeah. and other like mixed morphology remnants, where you can see that there is some interaction going on. Yeah. That's okay, well, thank you very much. I think with that, uh, we will just round up the colloquium. Before we thank Manami, I'd like to just make some announcements. I think that was it. So with that, I think it's time to thank uh, Manami for this extremely interesting view of what is obviously an observationally rapidly developing subject. And it does have connotations, as we heard also from the discussions in a lot of other fields. So thank you very much, Manimi, for telling us all about it. Thank you.